Hello, good evening everyone. Um, this is the planning subcommittee meeting. My name is Councillor Barbara Blake and I'm the chair of this committee. If I could ask members to introduce themselves, please, starting with the vice chair. Councillor Reg Rice, Tottenham Hill Ward. Councillor Scott Emery, uh, Highgate Ward. Councillor Sue Jameson, Bruce Carson. Councillor John Bevan, Northumberland Park. Councillor Cathy Brennan, Muswell Hill. Councillor Alex Worrell, Stroud Green. Councillor George Dunst. Sorry, George Dunstall, Stroud Green. Thank you. Um, and Councillor Amina Ibrahim has notified us that she is running a little late. Um, anyway, hopefully she will uh, turn up in time. So we're now on to item one, which is filming. Oh, sorry, sorry. So um, I'm going ahead of myself. Um, can I ask the officers present to introduce themselves, please? Hody Sprott, Principal Committee Coordinator. Matthew Barrett, Legal Services. Rob Shasovsky, Assistant Director for Planning, Building Standards and Sustainability. Robbie McNocker, Head of Development Management and Planning Enforcement. Valerie O'Key, Principal Planning Officer. John McRory, Major Applications Team Leader. Joshua O'Donnell, Senior Transport Planning Officer. Richard Truscott, Design Officer. Murray Richards, Transport and Highways Team Manager. Thank you very much. Um, and are there any officers in attendance virtually? Suzanne, but she'll introduce me. OK, um, so uh, those officers in attendance virtually will introduce themselves when relevant. So we're now on to item one. This is filming at meetings. This meeting is being recorded. All registered speakers should be aware that they will be recorded for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting. Item two, the planning protocol. Uh, members and speakers are requested to note the information set out at item two on the agenda, which I won't read out, but it's there on the agenda. Um, item three, apologies. Um, I've received one um, uh, item of uh, one apology from Councillor Nicola Bartlett. Item four, urgent business. So there are no items of urgent business. And we're on to item five, which is declarations of interest. So do members have any declarations of interest? No. OK, thank you. So we're on to item six. This is the minutes of the meetings held on the uh, on the 16th of October. Uh, do we agree those? To, do we approve the minutes? Approved, thank you. So we're now on to item seven, which is planning applications. Um, and we're here uh, this evening to discuss uh, the Braemar Avenue Baptist Church. However, members, you will note that there is a, an addendum which um, has been produced due to a late objection. So I am proposing a 15 minute adjournment so that members, you can read the um, addendum. Is that agreed? Thank you. OK, so we will adjourn for 15 minutes uh, and to people in the gallery. Um, there are some copies of the addendum, I think, have been circulated uh, to you. So they're on that table there. OK, so uh, we're all going to read the addendum for 15 minutes. Thank you.
OK, right. Well, thank you very much. So we will now resume the meeting. Uh, Councillors Ibrahim and O'Donovan have now joined us. So could you introduce yourselves, please? Um, Councillor Amina Ibrahim, uh, Councillor for Noel Park Ward. Hello, I'm Councillor Sean O'Donovan, Councillor for Tottenham Hale Ward. Thank you. Um, and do you have any declarations of interest? No. OK, thank you. So we're now on to item eight, um, and this is the Braemar Avenue Baptist Church, um, and it is set out in the pack at pages seven to 176. I won't read out the proposal because, as I said, that's in the pack. Um, the recommendation is to grant. Um, I would like to confirm, firstly, though, with the committee's agreement, that the committee will allow four speakers in relation to this item, one of them being Councillor Mason. There will be four speakers in objection who will have three minutes each to speak. The applicant team will have a total of 12 minutes to speak. Is this agreed? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, I'll now hand over to uh, the planning officer to introduce the application. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The proposal description is for full planning and listed building consent for the demolition of the existing church hall, a 1950s brick addition to the rear of the main church building and redevelopment of the site to provide a part one, part four storey building plus basement comprising a new church hall and associated facilities at ground and basement level and self-contained residential units at ground to full floor level with associated refuse, recyc recycling storage, cycle parking facilities, including landscaping improvements. This is the site location plan. The site is located at the top of Braemar Avenue to the eastern side at the junction with Bounds Green Road. The site highlighted in red is occupied by the 1950s brick addition and existing church hall to the rear of the main church, which is highlighted in blue. Both sites fall under the applicant's ownership and the frontage of the main church is on Bounds Green Road. This is the aerial view of the site, including the main church highlighted in yellow. Immediately south and west of the site are the terrace houses on Braemar Avenue. And immediately east is the New River Path and Public Park, known as Nightingale Gardens. And to the north is Bounds Green Road. The main church building, highlighted in blue, is Grade 2 statutory listed. Both the listed church and the development site are located on the western edge of Trinity Gardens Conservation Area, which is highlighted in yellow. This is some site photos, which include the church tower, 1950s unsightly brick addition to the main church, and the existing metal church hall. The photo to the left is the impressive grade two listed late Gothic revival style Baptist church. And to the right is the very derelict metal church hall, which is cladded with corrugated metal with blue painted windows. The proposal is for the redevelopment of the site to provide a new part one and part four storey building plus basement to create 15 flats, masonettes in total, including a new single storey glass link entrance with access to the new hall at basement level and main church. The dwelling mix comprises seven one bed, five two beds and three three beds 
And the proposal also includes private amenity space and soft and hard landscaping. And the proposed scheme will be car free and include two blue bad spaces. Listed building consent and planning permission is also sought for. The demolition of the existing 1950s extension and church hall, repairs to the existing roof of the church when needed, stone brick restorations when needed, cleaning of the existing elevation, repairs to the railway and dwarf railing, sorry, and dwarf plinth, and upgrade to existing hard and soft landscaping where required. The considerations include the principle of the development, affordable housing, heritage impact, quality of design, quality of accommodation, landscaping, impact on amenity, transport and sustainability. This is the proposed ground floor plan. The main church is currently accessed off Bounds Green Road and the proposal provides secondary access to the church from the new single storey Glaze Link, which is located between the church and the new building. The Glaze Link also provides access to the new hall at basement level. The new entrance forecourt will provide new soft and hard landscaping. A new secure external cycle shelter is proposed at the frontage. Two disabled parking bays are located on the street. Four of the residential flats at this level are masonettes with accommodation also at basement level. The wheelchair accessible flat is to the rear. The communal refuse store for the flats is located at this level and each ground floor flat has a private garden. This is the proposed basement plan. The masonettes will have residential accommodation at this level. The residential accommodation will be served by good sized light wells to enable sufficient outlook from the rooms. And the communal cycle store for the flats is located at this level. And the new church hall located at this level will have seating capacity for 97 people and will include toilet facilities, plant room and a small courtyard. I will now focus on one of the key issues. In terms of principle of the development, the new hall would replace the, the derelict hall building, which the church has been unable to maintain for a number of years due to lack of funds. The replacement church hall is to serve the operational and functional needs of the church as required by policy DM49. A community use plan will secure the opportunity for the new church hall to be used by the local community and the hall will also be flexible to accommodate other activities such as a crash, coffee morning, meeting space, kids club and polling station. In terms of the quality of the space for community use, the new church facilities will be inclusive for all users, providing much more visible, welcoming, level access to the church, its halls and toilets. And the introduction of new residential land use on the site is acceptable and the proposal will provide much needed contribution to the borough's housing stock. In terms of affordable housing, the scheme was independently assessed, demonstrating that affordable housing is not viable on this site. The scheme with 100% private housing provides a deficit against the viability benchmark. One residential unit will be assigned as a manse to be used only by the church and will not be income generating. The development will provide the funds to enable the required restoration refurbishment works to the listed church to be carried out. An early and late stage review mechanism will be secured by a legal agreement and a mechanism whereby no more than one of the residential units can be occupied until the restoration works of the Grade 2 listed church are completed will also be secured by a legal agreement. This is the proposed front elevation, which shows the single storey glaze link between the church and the new residential block. The height of the new building at four storeys successfully 
responds to the site's context and existing built form of surrounding buildings, and that it will appear as a three-storey building with a gentle step up of one floor over the two-storey houses immediately adjacent, transitioning in height towards the taller church towers. This slide also shows the proposed refurbishment restoration works to the existing church. This is the proposed rear elevation. This is the view of the proposed residential block and glazed link from Braemar Avenue. The new residential block will be constructed in red brick and include powder coated window frames, pink metal cladding for the recessed top floor and light metal balustrade for the balconies. And the link will be glazed and of contemporary style with black metal framing. This is a view of the church and the new building on Bremer Avenue. This is another view from Bremer Avenue towards the church. This is a view of the new building from Nightingale Gardens. The flats masonettes with an east facing aspect will benefit from the pleasant green outlook of the adjacent park with screening to mitigate overlooking while also allowing passive surveillance and animation to the park. This is the view from Bounds Green Road towards the church where you can barely see the development. In terms of the heritage impacts, the proposed design has benefited from extensive pre-application discussions and a formal design review that have sought to address both the heritage sensitivity of the development site and the opportunity to manage change within the heritage setting through informed and context sensitive design. The demolition of the existing church hall, a 1950s brick addition, is acceptable. The 1950s extension is unsightly and the design value of the tin tabernacle is low as its fabric is in a decayed state and suffers from evident structural issues and all of the architectural features that contributed to the architectural quality of the formal church hall have been lost. The proposed development will lead to very low, less than substantial harm to the significance of the conservation area and its assets, which will be outweighed by the public benefits of the development. The works of the Grade 2 listed church are welcomed and will greatly improve and enhance the character of the church as a focal building within the conservation area and will have a positive impact on the character of the listed building. Given the above and the support from the conservation and the design officer and the quality review panel, the proposed development in conservation and heritage terms is supported. This is the proposed upper floor plans. Note how the building steps back from the neighbours immediately south at upper floor level. Also note how the building also steps back to avoid the tree on the boundary. The first and second floor have private amenity space in the form of a balcony and the two flats on the third floor have access onto private terrace. An intensive green roof is proposed on the roof of the new single storey glazed link and the upper floor flats to the east will have a view onto the park. This is the proposed landscaping plan, soft, and hard landscaping is proposed around the boundaries of the sites within the landscape entrance courtyard, private gardens, church amenity space, and at roof level. This is the proposed tree plan. 11 trees will be retained within the church boundaries and immediately adjacent to the site within Nightingale Gardens. A total of five trees have been identified for removal, including the mature ash tree on the eastern boundary, which suffers from significant deadwood throughout with symptoms of the terminal um, disease ash dieback. It is proposed that 10 new trees, which comprise of eight trees along the courtyard entrance and two in front of the new residential building are provided. And the applicant has also agreed to the planting of three mature replacement trees on the Nightingale's Gardens boundary immediately east of the site to compensate the loss of the mature ash tree. In terms of impact on amenity, there would be no material impact on the amenity of nearby residents in regards to loss of outlook or privacy and the impact on daylight sunlight is minimal. 
The hall within the basement where activities take place will be insulated from causing disturbance to the main church space and existing and proposed residential neighbours. To mitigate loss of privacy and overlooking, in particular to the gardens of the terrace immediately south of the site on Braemar Avenue, the use of high level windows to the south facing living room dining kitchen area at first and second floor level is proposed, as well as non accessible areas of the roof terrace, which serve the unit on the third floor. In terms of transport and parking, the P Tower 6A, which is very good. The scheme is a car free development. Two on street blue badge parking bays are proposed. And in terms of the residential units, 26 long stay and four short stay cycle parking spaces are proposed. And in terms of the church, four long stay and seven short stay cycle parking spaces is proposed. In terms of delivery and servicing activity, deliveries for the church will remain as present and up to two deliveries per day would be expected for the residential development. And the refuse and recycling store is accessed via the entrance courtyard. This is the section 106 head of terms. Officers recommend the committee resolves to grant planning permission subject to conditions and planning obligations as set out in the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you for that. So uh, do members have any questions, any um, questions of clarification? Uh, to the for the planning officer, please. So I've got Councillor Emery and uh, Councillor Emery and Councillor Rupp. So yeah, I just want to get an explanation on one of the addendum points um, in terms of the three bed unit for the pastor. Just wanted to know if you could explain how that a home that is reserved for a member of staff can be counted as a three bedroom unit for the council stats. Thank you, Councillor. So. Um, the um, point that was levelled in the objection was that um, this shouldn't be counted as a, um, a unit that contributes to housing in the borough. Um, our assessment is that, that that's not correct, that um, you know, this still goes into the pool of housing in the borough um, and you know, can be occupied by a family. So um, there's, there's no reason that that restriction on its use in terms of the past are necessarily um, means that it shouldn't be treated as, as part of the housing stock um, for the borough. Um, it, it will have an occupation restriction, but um, you know it's it's still part of the private housing stock, albeit reserved for the pastor of the church. Councillor Rice. Thank you. Firstly, I would like to thank the officers for a very full and clear report. Uh, can I just hear you this? Two blue badge schemes on the parking arrangements. I mean, this is a church, and people do die and have funerals, and there tend to be large funerals. In those circumstances, why only provide for two blue badge parking spaces? Uh, on page, I'm not sure what page this is, 307 in the supplementary bundle. There's a phrase that I haven't come across before. It talks about mischaracterization of planning officer's summary. What does that mean? What's mischaracterizations? You find a page. Is a page with a little uh, rugged old hole in the top right hand corner. Talking about on the addendum, yes. Councillor Rice. Yes. Can you see it? No. I can. Hold it up so that I can see Sorry. it, please. It's on this page. Right. Uh, so, OK, can you just... Uh, I just wanted... Just explain again, please, because I, 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 I missed it. I'm asking for an explanation. I just Ask want again. To know, then. I want to know what that phrase means. I haven't seen it before. What does it mean? What it relates to? 
Chair, if I could just um, provide clarity. So this is um, the um, late objection we received, um, paragraph 17 of that um, in the addendum. So um, in that, the objector um, suggests that the planning officer's um, summary has, has um, mischaracterized um, communities' responses. So um, they're saying that the, um, the way we've represented um, their concerns um, misrepresents them. So um, it, it might perhaps be a, a question for the objector um, when, when they come to speak. Yeah, sure, look at cover off the parking spaces. Uh, Marie, just Council Planning. So, Council, there, there is no change to the existing activities in the church. So, normally, when a church has a funeral and they require a parking permit, they normally phone through to a parking service who can uh, offer suspensions or permits on the day. And I think that takes place for another church that's on Green Lanes. So I've attended it myself. So, the blue badge places are to service the residential element of the development proposal. So we can comply with the London plan in terms of that 10% blue badge parking for the 15 units. If there's a member of the clergy living on site, then it would mean only one blue badge space rather than two, because presumably that member of the clergy would have access to that parking space. O only our residents who are disabled will have uh, access to that car parking space. So that car free restriction uh, that's attached to the planning permission will apply to that member of the clergy unless that member of the clergy has a disability. Uh, so it's, it's clearly only for residents with disability. That's why it's a blue badge space. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor Worrell. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, firstly, if officers could clarify this point about it being an enabling development. So is it an enabling development? Has that been clear from the start? Have people been made aware from that from the start? And um, yeah, should that have been made clear? Thank you. Um, so um, for committee's purposes, this is not an enabling development, and we've um, made that clear in the addendum. Um, Enabling development is a specific term in an assessment of um, policy, which says that you um, are allowing something that's harmful to heritage in the interest of benefiting fitting heritage. So um, taking a, a derelict building um, and allowing some um, new development in the grounds of that that you wouldn't normally permit for that funding to then restore the um, historic building would be the best example of that. So um, the viability assessors have used that term just slightly loosely um you know that they're viability experts are not planning experts so um they've, they've used those terms um in some of the reports which has led to that confusion um there are works um to the church um but we are not saying in this case that there's a harm to heritage that we wouldn't normally accept um that those um restoration works are in some way mitigating um can i have a couple more questions um so just on the um, the housing provision, please could you clarify why the applicant wouldn't be required to submit um, a sort of affordable housing payment in lieu if they're not providing any? And when the um, report kind of speaks about this being, you know, adding to much needed housing stock, could you just clarify sort of where it is in all the different uh, policy documents, uh, kind of what need that would be contributing to, because obviously the most critical need is for social housing. So, I mean, are we saying that there is also a shortage of, um, you know, houses for people to buy? Or are we thinking this will contribute to like private rented stock? Like what is the need that that's meeting if not affordable? So just um, if I can find it, yeah. So um, if you go to page 25, um, paragraph 6.23 um, is, is really the, the sort of key policy um, issue here, which is our, our housing target. Um, so that's um, 1,592 dwellings per annum. So that's to um, a 
that's assessed by the GLA and, and our own assessments of our um, housing needs. So that's to meet the housing needs um, of population growth and residents um, to support the, that, that housing need, um, the local economy and those issues. Um, if you don't deliver on that, um, there are obviously impacts on um, how you have to assess planning applications. So um, we at the moment don't have a five year housing land supply. Um, which means your subject, your decisions are subject to the tilted balance. So um, that certainly weakens your decision making. Um, we're not saying in this case that that has undermined this. Um, in this case, we find the application to be in line with policy. But were you to find something that um, was slightly misaligned with policy, you have to give that tilted balance to the, towards the delivery of housing. So um, that's a, a key reason to ensure that you're delivering on your housing targets in planning policy terms. You've also got the sort of on the ground issue of, of meeting the, the needs of your residents. Um, and obviously, if you don't that, you know, house prices continue to to um, increase and, um, you know, people are, are priced out of the market on that um, private market, um, which has negative consequences for the borough. So that's really um, the crux of, of why um, it's um, what whilst there is an important need for um, affordable housing, there's also a need to meet your um, targets in terms of private housing. And, and on the point about um, not having to pay, the, like a, make a payment in lieu for the lack of affordable. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the issue there is that the viability assessment has shown that that's not viable. Um, so it's showing a deficit of um, just over 300,000 um, uh, in terms of viability. Um, that's um, based on new land value, so um, the, the church isn't getting um, a receipt in terms of uh, what the land is worth, which would normally be accounted for um, in a viability assessment. Um, you then have a policy requirement um, to replace a community facility, in this case, um, the, the, um, the church hall and, and the element of that that's demolished um, needs replaced. Um, and our, we have policies that support that, so these things um, Eat into the viability, um, you know, even with new land value, and um, for a development of 15 units, um, it, it's small, so you don't have those economies of scale. So that's in, in a way what has led to this position that um, there is um, no extra um, money in the in the viability for affordable housing. And um, one of the issues that's been raised by the objectors is um, about the manse being a benefit to the church. And um, even if you did include that as a private um, sale. The development still would be unviable by a few thousand pounds. So, um, you know, it's a very marginal position, um, even, you know, stripping out some of those things and, and moving it around. So um, the, the evidence um, has been submitted. It's been tested by our experts in viability and, and find that a payment in lieu can't be provided in this case. Thank you. So I've got Councillor Ibrahim and Councillor Brennan. Councillor Ibrahim, please. Sorry, Councillor Worrell has um, pretty much covered some of the questions that I was going to ask about uh, affordability. Um, but I, if, 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 if you allow me, I just want to, you know, allow some more elaboration on that because that's my major concern. So in terms of the viability being so tight, um, so even, even the provision of one affordable home, is that to do with the fact that one of the could that possibly be the fact that one of the homes is actually not is, is just going to be um, let to the pastor so that won't be bringing in an income so potentially could that if, if that had been an affordable home for a, a family in the borough would that have made this different and so the short answer is no um even um when you look at the version of the viability where that was assessed as a private unit, um, it was thirty thousand pounds um, that would have been available for payment in lieu, but um, that was actually not based on the um, community infrastructure levy contributions that you'll see in the report. And when you add in the section one hundred six obligations for children's play space, the transport mitigation, and things like that, that um, wipes out that potential um, a sort of surplus that you would you would have had to put for a payment in lieu. No, no. I, I mean, yes, for a payment in lieu, up, you know, but that wasn't really what I was pushing at. So, yeah. if, if the if the um, if the applicant can provide a home that provides no income to the scheme, 
then had that home, uh, would that home potentially, if it wasn't uh, aligned that way, it could have been provided as at least one affordable home. And the numbers wouldn't currently provide yeah. knowing. Of yes, no, I, I understand. Yeah, so um, it would obviously have a lesser value than it would have had in a private um, a option. So um, it, that that thirty thousand pounds surplus would would drop even lower. Um, so uh, you know its value is is less. So uh, if you were to run that through the appraisal, you'd be getting a deficit. In this case, um, with that sort of zero value, that there's there's still a deficit. So um, it. Um, the, the numbers just don't support that you could we could insist on that being provided uh, as an affordable home um it, it, in a way it's a you know a, a decision that the developer has made um so we can't ins insist that that be an affordable home um in lieu of that follow up no i'm not i mean it's not about the insistence but could we could we argue that they could have if they wanted to they would have to make. They would have had to make the choice to do that. We we wouldn't have a, a, a any sort of stick in terms of um, viability policy to to make them do that. Um, the numbers just don't support that. Um, because it it would be unviable, and and we can't um insist that they provide an, an unviable development. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Councillor Brennan. Um. Well, one of my comments has pretty well been covered by Councillor Wall. Um, to Councillor Ibrahim, um, I am not happy with the idea of us not having social housing in this development. I don't totally agree with the. I don't know. I don't like it. I thought I didn't think that we were we we went ahead on those terms when we had more than nine buildings in a in a development. I thought that it was automatic that we would include social housing. So I don't understand how we've got fifteen and no social housing. Although you say it's not viable, but I have seen objections suggesting that the valuation could be questioned um so it might be viable that was one point and the second point which is just a personal thing i mean we say in the context this building fits within the environment i can't say that it really does i know it's colored pink and so is the brymar church but it's not in context with the area really i would say um it's not and I, I always question this, but I do again. Well, that's just a comment. But the, the social housing, I really would like them to, like, a good justification for us submitting it. So in terms of the policy on affordable housing, so anything um, over 10 units um, is, triggers a policy that requires on-site affordable housing, but that is subject to viability. So... Um, it's not an absolute requirement. Um, if the viability evidence shows that um, affordable housing cannot be provided, so that is the case here. Um, as, as I've spoken to in a bit of detail, um, in terms of the, um, the the late objection, um, the points they raise are, are that you know some some private developments haven't been included. Um, we're satisfied that you know our experts have, have interrogated this sufficiently and, and looked at those issues. They've included things like Clarendon Square. Um, you know that that's Barclay Homes, that's um, you know a, a big regeneration development of the highest quality. So that's probably the highest value you'll find in this area. Um, and you know we're satisfied that um, that's been considered, um, and they've looked at the, the at the value um, of these de this development in that context, and and that's the correct conclusions in terms of viability and values. Okay, Councillor O'Donovan. Thank you. Um, in terms of the of the church hall, which may possibly use for, for community use, I'm sure we'll be discussing that later. Um, I've been looking through, and I can't see any. Um, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything related to a lift. I assume there is a lift that's going down to the basement, which is where the uh, part, the, at least part of the church hall, will be in the basement. Um, the other thing is in relation to uh, the play space and. Um, and, and one of the items about this this development is that we're told that there's no space for 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 play area. Um, that therefore, it, um, or there, although it is near to a park, um, the 
GLA child play space um, calculation, which I'm sure has been done correctly, seems to come out with a figure of, of this this um, development will have 2.8 children, three children, which does seem to be an incredibly low figure for the amount of flats. Um, also, the con uh, financial contribution, as there's no play space, um, the developers have said they will make a financial contribution to play areas in the location, but the financial contribution is is 2, 000, only £2,660. I wasn't sure whether there was a zero missing, but maybe you could calculate, calculate that. Uh, sorry, confirm that. And then the final thing, um, and I think you had the last slide on, which had the photograph of of what it would look like. Um, this picture here, and I know printing is different. This picture here seems to imply that it's going to be a, a some sort of silvery colour. Other photographs I've seen or other images seem to imply it's going to be a pink colour. Um, what will it actually look like in relationship to the to the terrace houses nearby and also to the church? Not just what it will look like um, when it's built first, or but what will it look like after been after it's been weathered over a number of years? Thank you. So going back to the uh, actual child yield, that is based on the GLA calculator. So that figure is correct. And also with regards to the amount of 2,660 pounds, which is that that's the amount for the offsite child place based provision. This accords with the requirements set out in the planning obligations SPD. So there's a formula that's used in order to come to this figure. Yes, there is a lift um, in the new um, link, glaze link, which takes you to the basement as well. And because there's the hall in the basement, so you've got stairs and lift. So, and the new building does have a lift as well. OK, Councillor Rice, what's your question? Yeah, how does this lift relate to the underground tunnel? tunnels in respect to the London transport on the ground system. As I remember some years ago, there was a block of flats at the corner of Whiteman Road uh, and they had to be demolished because cracks were developed in the walls and they said that, that the demolition was due to uh, the on the ground rattling them by quite near. How does this system relate to that? Um, so London Underground are a consultee on that issue, so that they um, they are always conscious of um, excavation works uh, damaging their property and, and will um, raise concerns. Um, can you switch your mic off, please? Oh, oh. thank you. Yes, yeah, so say London Underground are a consultee on on applications and will comment where they're concerned um, that excavations would impact on their infrastructure. Um, so. Um, in this case, we, we can be satisfied that the, there's no objection or concern from them here um, that um, that their infrastructure would be um, damaged through that excavation. Um, and I think just the, the point on the um, image, so um, what's it attached um, to the objection in your um, addendum is an earlier iteration of the um, development. So that was a, a 16 unit development that was um, a consulted on with residents, I believe. Um, that has been then been amended through pre-application discussions with um, the officers, and it's probably just worth um, bringing in Richard Truscott just to explain um, the sort of um, rationale for the um, design and, and his comments on that in terms of how this fits um, with the surrounding context. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, we, we're conf I'm confident, and the quality review panel are confident that the appearance um, is appropriate to the context and. Um, use of brick is a durable material that will uh, stand the tests of time and the other materials are also will also be durable. They're obviously materials will be conditioned um, to be approved with samples um, before construction. Um, we don't insist on um, pastiche to match context. We uh, seek um, contemporary design that harmonizes with context such as a brick that um, 
matches the broad range of colours of bricks in the existing context, which I'm confident we will get. Um, we have uh, got from them in, in, in the in, in how much has been committed to on appearance so far. Um, there was a great deal of discussion about from, through the design process about whether there should be a second material matching the grey of the church. Um, but basically, the the simplicity of of a all pink brick um, scheme has been settled on, and I think it will be an excellent uh, choice that will um, fit in very much in the context. And the context is not uniform. The church is one design. One design. The 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 terrace. Two terraces on either side of Braemar Avenue are predominantly Edwardian, but there's quite a mixture of other things going on there. Directly opposite, there are some infill um, 1940s or 50s houses, presumably a bomb damage, and there are some more further down the road, um, and, 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 and some 1970s houses uh, closing off the end of the road. So there's a variety of different um, arch architectural styles in the context. Um, and I'm confident it will be a, a good contemporary building that will um, harmonise with that varied context, including with good matching materials, proportions, rhythm of bays and so on. The important things will match, but it does, it's, not a, it's not trying to be a pastiche of any of the existing context styles. Thank you. Um, so one last question from Councillor Brennan. Oh. <laughs> uh -uh. Councillor Brennan, quickly, please. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's more of a comment. I was just going to say that Brahma Avenue is different from Clarendon Square, and I don't think that there's been the small um, attention to detail to see that the, I think house prices are different on Brahma Avenue and Clarendon Avenue. And I also think that the um, style of Brahma Avenue is just not being taken into account. Really, in in the, in the style of this building, Councillor, but I am asking for uh, comments of clarification. Yes, so, no, I don't okay. need clarification. So you haven't got any. Okay, well, thank you anyway for your comment, Councillor Worrell. Please. Thank you. Just wanted to check: Am I understanding correctly? In the original application, there was a condition for um, only, I think it was something like the church hall has to be fully built and only 50% of the residential flats kind of been built by that point. Is that correct? And then in the addendum, that condition has been struck out. Is that right? Could you explain that? Yes, yeah, so um, on the page one of the addendum, um, that has been amended. So um, that was um, included um, prior to some detailed discussions with the applicant, um, and th that creates an issue of cash flow for them. So. Um, what we're trying to do here is, is sort of strike the right balance between um, pinning down the um, obligations to restore the the, um, the the church building and provide the community use without um, making it difficult to deliver that. Um, obviously, you need um, some residential units to sell to generate that income um, to do that restoration work. So um, the applicant was concerned by um, not being able to occupy more than 50 percent of the, um, those residential units without being able to then um, create the cash flow to um, have money to put into the church, let a contract for that, do those works and then um, be allowed to sell further um, units. So um, we've looked at you know what the value of those works are and, and what the value of the development is and, and um, determined that you know pinning that down to actually the final um, residential unit would be more appropriate and then um, just um, made sure that the the, um, the works to the um, church hall are also secured so that um, that community benefit um, is delivered um, before the value is realised from those residential um, flats. OK, right. Thank you. Thank you for those um, questions. So we now move on to the objectors. Um, so um, Terence McCarthy. OK, um, Sarah Ad Adelby, OK, um, Kathy Lee. Yes, if you would like to move forward and Councillor Mason. So uh, we need to bring another chair, please.
So, um, uh, no, um, the committee clerk is, is going to get some water. And I think Councillor Mason, are oh, you there? Do you want to, to come up and bring a chair up as well? OK, right. So I think the committee, the committee clerk has spoken to you. I did allow for objectors on the understanding that you don't repeat yourselves. Um, so I hope so you've liaised and that you have three minutes. So I will stop you um, when you've all had three minutes. OK, so. So. Use the microphone. Yeah. I would like just to clarify on the addendum that's been tabled tonight, which of course we've just had a chance to read. One of the points that I was going to be making is impacted by that addendum. And I wondered whether you might give me a little allowance of extra time, just a few seconds, to address what is now proposed in the addendum. Actually, I think you can pick that up during the questions from the from the councillors. So, um, no, I am going to keep you all to um, a strict three minutes. The committee clerk did um, explain all of that to you. So who who's going first, please? Uh, Terence McCarthy, I'll, I'll go first. OK, Mr McCarthy, if you'd like to start now. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Three Avenues Residents Association, Tara which represents over 60 households living in the vicinity of the church. Tara plays a major role in the community. All Tara members strongly object to a modern four-storey building with basement. The church and hall are listed buildings in the Trinity Gardens conservation area. The development will dominate the protected view of the church. The report obscures from you the substantial harm this development will have on the community. There is no assessment of loss of amenity suffered by neighbouring properties. The planning officer's report say there will be an impact, but neighbouring properties will not be materially affected. This has no evidential basis for that conclusion. We are particularly concerned about the loss of amenity to houses next to the development, particularly number one, Braemar Avenue. The suggestion that there is less expectation of privacy to street facing windows is wrong. Haringey's planning policies state that overlooking should be avoided. There is a substantial difference between a person looking across the road at another house and a person being able to overlook into our bedrooms. The Supreme Court said Tate Modern's viewing platform caused a substantial interference to residents because it was exceptional use of Tate's property. It is exceptional use of the church land to build residential flats that exceed the height of the houses where no other house on the street has a balcony on the front of the building. The lack of assessment means that the planning officer has inadequately considered these issues. On parking, there are no restrictions on Braemar Avenue in the evenings and all day Sunday. Parking is already a problem in the area, such that the church website itself advises the congregation to arrive early to secure parking and, car par and cars park illegally on the grass in front of the church. There has been no proper impact assessment of present and future parking. The traffic report is inadequate and the travel action plan simply will not work. There is no space for extra cars for visitors to the flats and events in the large meeting room. Braemar Avenue is a cul-de-sac with limited spaces for turning. Congestions, congestion will occur, causing noise and obstructing access for emergency vehicles to the sheltered accommodation at the end of the avenue. The increase in noise disturbance caused by extra visitors via the side entrance to the church and hall will exacerbate the problems already experienced by residents, especially late in the evening. Despite a wholly inadequate consultation, it is revealing that of 109 community responses, not one in support of thank the you, development. Ms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McCarthy, for that. Thank you. So um, who who wants to go next? And if you could just introduce yourself, please. Thank you. 
might I grab uh, is a the glass water, of water? Is the water? <laughs> the, all right, we'll, 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 it's on its way. We'll chase it up. My, it's a green bottle just outside my one of my daughter's bottles. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. It's only a little drop, but it will help. This time of year, it gives us all bits of coughs and colds. Thank you, Chair. My name is Cathy Lay and I'm a resident living at number three Braemar Avenue, which is two do doors down from the proposed site of the development. Don't let the developer try and persuade you this is for the local community. Aesthetics can be to personal taste, but this design is shocking. As the Victorian Society says, the proposal will negatively impact the setting of the listed building due to its height and does not harmonise with the street. Any acceptable proposal must be lower than the ridge of the street of the church. However, this will be at the ridge of the church. That is not what the designs show. And it is and isn't it strange that you have not been given the height of the building? A home application for extension would have the dimensions. How can you not have these dimensions for a four storey building squeezed onto a conservation area which demolishes a listed building? The report does not mention that the church and its chapel are the only Gothic grade two listed buildings in this part of Bounds Green. The cube is totally out of keeping with the street, as you'll have seen from the photos I have demonstrated, and does not support policies on green corridors, open space and green grid land. Our local area benefits from a, a church and terraced housing with green garden spaces. The bat survey is unconvincing. I see these amazing creatures as I live two doors down from the chapel swooping over this site and our gardens. We call for proper bat protection measures in line with legislation and consider the role of the tin chapel and whether the new build will impact the bat's environment. What is the public benefit here? We're told it's housing stock. But this is a small apartment block with apparently only 14 apartments available to the public. Yet the consequential damage to our environment, character of the street and loss of amenity is massive. We are told that de the development would be unviable if social or affordable housing would, were to be included. Yet there is a free apartment for the pastor. And I have to ask the question, who is in greatest need, the pastor or those on the council's housing waiting list? The section 106 proposes 20% of the on-site workforce for this development be Haringey residents. Without affordable housing, however, the flats will be built by people who can never afford to live there. Is that what we want? If this is meant to help Haringey, a condition should be that Haringey residents have priority. The report says the new hall will be for community, for the community, but that was what the applicant says. I see with the addendum. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Am you. I allowed to just build out that point in answer to no, your question? No, that's it. Then? I said strict three minutes, so I have to keep to that. So if we can have I wish next... to lodge a complaint, please, and can the minutes show? I think that that's an, 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 a, a less than transparent process. Thank you. Finish, okay, finish your sentence. Thank you. I will just consolidate. So, 
The report says the new hall will be for the community, but that was what the applicant says. The sole office offer from the applicant was that they may discuss community use in the future. The current offer before you now, Chair, is that they will put together a plan to charge the community for future use. But the congregation here isn't local. They didn't respond to the cons consultation. See, that is more than a sentence. Could you just, can you yes. just finish now, please? But the point is that I needed to address that the current offer is to not. Okay, you can you can, you can address that in 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 okay. you can address that in in the the question and answer. Fair enough. I do have to be fair to everyone. So who is the next person who wants to speak? And that's Miss Sorry, Adelby. Adelby. Um, Chair, I'm just going okay. to, my phone is out so I can keep an eye on my time as well, if that's all right. So. Well, we'll keep an eye on it as well. I mean, I'm trying to be fair to everyone here. I'm sure you understand, you all understand that. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Today, I'm going to address you on three points. Firstly, the viability assessment of affordable housing. A key point is that the calculations take into account the costs of private enrichment of the applicant's interests. The repairs, a free flat, a new church hall. That enrichment stands at £1,541,656. Without those costs, housing, affordable housing must be viable and you don't have an assessment showing it's not. Secondly, enabling development. For the first time, it is explicit in the report that no affordable housing is being provided and the applicant is not complying with planning law because the money is being used to fund repairs to a listed building. That is, contrary to what is said, an enabling development. And so the applicant has not complied with DM9J of housing, uh, Haringey's policies that the applicant must show that this is the only viable means of securing the long-term future of the church and is supported by an appropriate options appraisal. There is no form of viability, uh, en uh, enabling development assessment, including one that justifies that it is not. It is fundamental to looking at these heritage assets as required by the 1990 Act and granting planning permission based on these failures could render the whole decision challengeable. Historic England hasn't responded adequately because they have not been consulted properly. They have not been explicitly told that this is a potential enabling development, nor that the demolition involves a whole heritage asset, not just a hall. Thirdly, the heritage assets. The Tin Chapel is a listed non-designated heritage asset and that value has not been assessed at all. The true value of the heritage assets in a conservation area therefore cannot be weighed, let alone be given great weight in accordance with the 1990 Act and the National Framework. The heritage statement ignores that the 1950s extension was part of the church when it was listed in 1976. In our street that was bombed in the war, that extension reflects Haringey's recovery after World War II. How? can that have no historical value. The report also ignores paragraph 196 of the framework, which states that the church's decision to let the Tin Chapel deteriorate should not be taken into account in any decision. The objection of the Victorian Society is, cannot be dismissed and the heritage ass assessment is wholly inadequate. Thank you, That's, thank you. Okay, um, so we now have Councillor Mason. And you have three minutes, Councillor Mason. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here representing Bounds Green and in particular the set of roads of which Braemar Avenue is one of those roads. The Baptist Church is one of four churches on Bounds Green near the Wood Green High Road. Um, and it is a church which is independently funded and financially self-sustaining. Unlike the other three churches, Braemar Road is not a community church, but is a property trust and is also part of a community of Baptist churches. So this development is one of a number of developments that the Baptist churches have put together in order to sustain the future of their, of, um, their community. Um, but 
not in order to be um, financially viable in terms of the need for selling houses on their site. That is not part of their property trust. So let's just consider this is not as set out a needed or wanted community development. There are plenty of church halls, community halls, schools, etc., with halls to rent in the area. We've got loads of them. What we haven't got is any free or easily accessible community space for the people who live in the area, of which over 40% of people are impoverished and under in fairly dire need as is exampled by the fact that very many people on Braemar Road, which is close to St Michael's Church Hall, are supporters of the food bank and volunteer regularly for it. The church, however, does not do this. The church is not integrated and has no place in the community, besides which the other three churches, the Greek church, the um, the Church of England Church and the Seventh-day um, Adventist Church all contribute to the community. This is not a community um, viable project. So the church meets once a week um, and is let out to other churches twice a week. Um, the tabernacle has not been used for between 15 to 20 years. It used to be a scout's hut and people here who are have grown up children remember it, but anybody else doesn't remember it. So it's not been used by the community for a very, very long time. The second point I wish to address is, although decent and affordable housing is needed in the borough, the biggest problem isn't a lack of high quality dwellings, but the lack of social housing for the 4,000 children, 4,000 children in temporary accommodation, including um, people from Bounds Green who are now living in hotels with no cooking facilities because they were evicted by their private rented landlords. And this development only provides one three bed unit and the other one is given to the pastor. The local plan policy SP2 states that affordable housing target is 40% of developments over 10 units. We could have at least three social housing units if they were given the priority they should be in this development. Thank you, Councillor Thank Mason. You. Thank you very much for that. So thank you to all of the objectors. So um, any question, questions, please, from the committee. Councillor Ibrahim. Uh, Can you put your mic? Um, you wanted to elaborate further on some of you, um, some questions with regard to the addendum. Um, I'll ask you um, if you could do that. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, I was just reading at speed what the addendum was saying about community use and the concern we have is that there's now a current offer to attach a condition that would allow allow the community to be consulted on that use after the approval in principle of this planning consent and our concern quite frankly is that we're a really integrated community you've heard from our councillor councillor mary mason we do act as a community but since 2018 we haven't once been invited to contribute to what the community use might be for this building we have all sorts of really interesting ideas about what this site could provide including affordable and social housing but not once have our views been sought okay thank you so i want to bring uh, robbie mcnocker in now please Thank you, Chair. I think just to be clear for members um, in terms of um, what you should be, sh should be considering in terms of a community use, um, uh, there's a definition of, of that set out in the local plan and, and in coming from the London plan. Um, that includes um, church halls, community centres, churches. Um, it doesn't matter um, where the, re where the um, users of that building are coming from um, or any of those issues. Um, you know, this is a church and its facilities can be classed as a community use for planning purposes. Um, and our policy says that those should be reprovided and enhanced um, where possible. So that's just something to be clear in your minds in terms of how you categorize this. Um, um, yeah, I'm sure that there's some there could be validity to the concerns of, of residents of, of voice, but um, in pure planning terms, um, your only material consideration is you know that this is is it functions as a community use, and the um, the additional condition that has been attached to that is to provide. 
um, some enhancement to that um, to ensure that it, it does um, maximise um, the potential use of that building for the community. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Bevan. Sorry. Yeah. So the the uh, objector who said about if we didn't build the community hall or the church hall, we could just build more affordable housing. I think I'm correct in saying, officers will tell me if I'm wrong, I think we would be in breach of our local plan and the GLO's plan if we allowed this development to go ahead without any community use. Um, yes, um, that's, that's correct. So um, there would be a, a direct um, tension with policy DM39, which um, requires the reprovision of community uses. Um, so um, obviously you always have a choice um, in how you give weight to the policies of your, of your local plan. Um, but in this case, we've got a proposal to reprovide this community use um, and we find that to be in line with DM39 um, and um, acceptable. Um, you could wish to, to balance the planning balance differently, but in in this case, we find this to be um, an acceptable balance um, to provide that community use and, and align closely with um, DM39. Uh, Miss Lisa, you indicated you wanted yeah. to answer that question. I think okay. there might have been a misunderstanding of my point, Chair. I wasn't suggesting that we sacrifice the community use, but that we sacrifice the manse that was being suggested might be provided free of charge to the rector, and that that instead could be substituted for social or affordable housing. It was it was it was directed at your comment. May I may I answer? Um, it, my point was that this isn't a community use in the sense of the public community, which is what is identified in planning policies. It's the community of the internal community of the applicant, and that is why it's a private benefit. And once you re-add the costs for the private benefit that has been taken off and you re-add the costs for the building of the flat and you re-add the costs of the repairs to the church which will be a private asset if it is not an enabling development all of that money together when you redo a viability assessment it would seem on the face of it that it ha affordable housing should be possible but critically you haven't been given that assessment and the independent financial assessor says in their report they were not given the assumptions that the applicant had to assume and calculate that affordable housing was not viable so they have deliberately disabled the independent financial assessor to be able to give you that information that would support their conclusion and in, uh, I would say that is because if they were given that information, along with the appropriate comparators, you would see that affordable housing is viable on this site. Chair, if I could just come in and, and clarify on that. Um, so um, I think uh, uh, what the objector is drawing on is um, what the viability assessor has said. So. Um, the example um, that we, we've um, discussed with them um, was a um, horse racing track. So the um, the jockey club there said that um, they wanted to do an enabling development. Um, so they would um, build some residential on their greenbelt site um, and use that to fund a new stand within um, the race course. So, um, but in that case, there was no policy that said you should build a new stand for your race course. So um, the viability assessors um, said, well, actually what you should do is go from a baseline of what's a um, viable affordable housing position, um, you know, 40%, and then is there money left over to um, deliver the improvements to your race course? So in this case, um, we do have a policy that says you should provide community use, so that's different. It's not like a private venture, like a, a race course. Um, and um, also, um, I think the, the sort of the the principal um, issue is, you know, is it viable or not? So um, if you look at the, the numbers in terms of um, the reprovision of the community facility um, in, in terms of the whole, you, you could take a different planning balance and say we'd rather have affordable housing than that, but that would be in tension with your, your policy DM39. Um, 
when you look at the um, the policy, it says that um, it should be in terms of sites that can viably deliver development and other planning benefits. So the re, the re, um, the works to the list of building um, are another planning benefit. That's the restoration of a heritage asset. Um, and then e either way, if the manse is um, provided as a private unit or not, the development's still not viable. So um, once you're underwater, then there's no incentive for a developer to bring that forward. And in, in this case, the church, if they're not getting their months, um, they they don't um, get they, they don't have a, vi a development that's attractive to them, and, and they're not going to bring it forward. So um, either way, you know, on paper, those benefits do add up to a significant amount of money. But actually, um, the, the scheme's still viable if you take out the months. Um, if you take out the church hall, um, it, it's it's not in line with policy. And in the case um, of the um, the racetrack, they were they were still including a value for that land, um, whereas in this case, you don't have a value for the land and um, that hasn't been included in the viability assessment. And that was um, in some ways what tension there was between how our viability assessor found it that they said, well, actually, you should be included, including a value for the land. And in this case, obviously, that value for the land would then go back to the church. So um, either way, whatever way you wash it, um, there's just not enough money um, to viably provide the um, policy compliant benefits here and some affordable housing. OK, thank you. So does the committee have any more questions to the objectors, please? Councillor Rice. No one has yet answered my question, but I raised the issue of mischaracterization in the planning officers report. I, I will start tell them by the AD that uh, perhaps one of the questions may be able to answer it. Does anybody ever give an answer to that? And in addition, one of the questioners raised the issue of overlooking. It hadn't been raised before, but she raised a question of the issue of overlooking from the rail into people's habitable rooms. Uh, I wonder whether the officers have, have looked at that before. Right, so I think your question, your questions are addressed to you, Mr. Delby. Uh, uh, thank which because you wrote this letter. So if you want to clarify those, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor, I refer to the mischaracterizations as meaning that the way that the um, planning officer has described the objections from the community is at points inaccurate or strips out any nuance that have been raised in the objections. You can see in your planning officer's report a number of bullet points that last about a page and a half. That is a summary of what totals, if you, um, if you combine it, about approximately 180 pages worth of objections. And that's why I say aspects are mischaracterized. In the table that follows, I have highlighted those that are in yellow, which are um, statements in the first column in the planning officer's report, and the correction by reference to not my opinion, but by a reflection of the documents that were provided by the applicant clarifying why it was inaccurate, and shaded in red uh, are aspects that are materially omitted. Uh, so I hope that that clarifies that. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight, I see DM39 on the strategy as being about warehouse living. I, I don't know if that's, is that correct? Is that what we 49 were, then, sorry. 49. Yeah, yeah, apologies. Right, well, thank you for that. So no more questions. Okay, so thank you to, um, to all of you. Um, if you would kindly take your seats back in the gallery. I can't hear you, Councillor Rice. Sorry. Okay, it hadn't been answered. Sorry, Mrs. Delby. Can you just so Councillor Rice asked a question, wanted to ask the objectors a question about overlooking. Yes. The objector who brought it up in terms of the people' private rooms are being overlooked from the rear. I just wanted to know what the evidence to support that. 
Um, no, so the uh, objection about overlooking was in response to the planning officer's uh, statement that there is less expectation of privacy for street facing windows. The upstairs, I'm sorry, that's a bit louder than I had intended it to be. Um, the upstairs uh, of all of the houses on Braemar Avenue, because they are standard shapes, the front room is a bedroom. And that is the evidence that if it overlooks from the balconies and the fourth and third floors of this apartment um, complex, you will be able to see into the front bedrooms of the houses opposite. I hope that addresses it. Thank you very much, Chair. All right. Thank you. So I just want the planning officers to come back on on that, please, if they could, just so that. Yeah, thank you. I think um, the design officer, Richard, um, is happy to just um, cover that point. Um, so, uh, your, the, 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 the objector's concern is that um, people from first and second floor windows and balconies of the new flats would have uh, would have a would be able to look across the street into the windows of the houses opposite, um, and why we would not normally consider there's as great an expectation of privacy from street fronting windows even at first floor as there is from garden fronting windows which is the normal expectation. Well, the, the, there are, obviously there will be people, the members of the general public will be able to um, look into windows facing the street from street level. So that's one of the reasons why there's less expectation of privacy uh, from the street side than there is from the garden side. Admittedly, that's not exactly the same as the uh, ability to view across the street from windows at uh, first and second floor level, um, but there is an existing uh, ability for people to view across the street from when from existing houses at first and second floor level uh, further up the street where there are houses directly facing each other across the street uh, we don't know how people use their their houses and whether they have their living rooms on the ground floor or first floor that's um, that could easily be changed without uh, planning uh, getting involved um, and um, it doesn't that make that much difference whether people can see from a bedroom window at first floor level to a bedroom window or a living room window to a living to a bedroom window um it's still a street facing window and the street is fairly wide it's it, it's it's uh, it, it, it's um 15 or 16 meters wide there, there there won't be that much uh loss of privacy across the street people can put net curtains up if they're that concerned about privacy um it's a very normal urban situation um under the existing situation to have windows across the uh, on, on uh, facing each other across the street also just to note the closest separation distance is actually 20 meters which would ensure privacy is maintained okay all right thank you what's just been said i think the objector i think it was mr mccarthy actually mentioned a particular house it was number one and i think that's on one of the, the photographs um has there been consideration in relation to the um closeness of the windows of number one and the new development thank you right so to mitigate the loss of privacy and overlooking in particular to number one the windows have been amended to high level windows and also the um, terrace as well on third floor level is now non-accessible on that side facing number one's garden and beyond. Right okay thank you so thank you um, thank you again to the objectors thank you to the committee for all of the questions so I'm now moving on to the supporters which I think is the applicant team and that is Mandit, Mandip Sahota and Andrew Budgen. Yes, OK, so you have 12 minutes. Could you just introduce yourselves, please, before you speak? Thank you. Good evening, Chair and members. Um, I'm Mandip Sahota from NTA Planning. This is uh, Andrew Budgen uh, from Space Lab and Herb Lab, who are the architects and developers. Um, so this application before you follows extensive discussion with officers since around July 2018, uh, when we first approached the Council about this proposal. Since then, we've had four pre-application meetings and presented the scheme to the quality review panel and to local residents and have continued the dialogue with officers throughout that period. Taking on board the comments, the proposals seek to replace and rationalise and improve the existing defunct church hall and to improve the operational requirements of the church use and of the present and future needs of 
its community. The starting point for this proposal is the church works. The new hall will replace the derelict hall building, which the church have been unable to use for a number of years, as we've heard today, due to principally a lack of funds and the inability to repair that building or replace it. The facility that is proposed will serve the needs of the church, including its Sunday school and other church related activities. There would also be the opportunity for the new church hall to be used by the local community, offering a flexible space that can accommodate a variety of activities or hired for other appropriate events, which would also provide a vital income stream for the church perpetuity. The works also include improvements and repairs to the principal listed building including repairs to the roof, the walls, and providing the funds which the church do not currently have. The new hall and listed building repairs will be facilitated, uh, not enabled, um, through the building of the 15 flats. Uh, whilst the affordable units can't be delivered due to the viability, the sale of these flats will create the necessary funds required to deliver the community use benefits. Without these funds, the church would not be able to deliver on these ambitions. The 15 flats will also contribute towards the housing stock in the borough. It's noted that the council at the present time is unable to fully evidence its five year housing land supply, and therefore these new homes would contribute to meeting that identified target. The site of the Brownfield location, close to sustainable transport connections, has a PTEL of six. Um, it's in an established residential area and uh, we're of the view that it should be strong, strongly supported for its uh, further intensive use for residential use. The mix of the units uh, meets the council's requirements. There are, there are actually three um, family size units, not two, I think were mentioned earlier. Uh, the quality of those flats also meet all uh, internal and external space standards. Um, there's been various comments about external balconies being on the building, but that is primarily a function of housing standards that we have today. We, we have to provide external spaces to individual flats. There's there's no getting around that. Um, it's just turning to design. As I've previously noted, this, uh, this scheme has benefited from extensive pre-application discussion and uh, formal design review. Um, and that process we feel has addressed both the heritage sensitivity points that uh, we've, we've heard today um, and also has provided this this opportunity to provide a high quality mixed use development, which we feel responds uh, Those proposals are supported by the quality review panel and the council's design and council uh, conservation officers, as we've heard today. Um, through those discussions, we have also looked to design out any material harm to neighboring uh, amenity, both in terms of sunlight, daylight, to outlook, to privacy, and that's evidence in the reports and also noted in quite a lot of detail in the officers' committee report. Um, a further uh, amenity point is that of, of parking. It is a car-free scheme. Uh, we're going to have appropriate cycle storage uh, facilities on site for both the residential and the church elements, uh, partly internally, part externally within the building for short and, and long stay provision. So in, in summary, the works of the grade two listed church will greatly improve and enhance the character of the church as a focal building within the conservation area. And in our view, will have a positive impact on the character of the listed building. The proposed development will lead to very low and less of substantial harm to the significance of the conservation area and its assets, which would, which in our view, again, would be outweighed by the public benefits of the development. The public benefits include the repairing of the listed church, the provision of new church facilities, which meet current and future needs of the church and the local community, and the provision of 15 high quality homes, which will contribute to the borough's housing stock and targets, which the council are currently unable to meet. I just um, wanted to mention a couple of points that were raised by uh, these speakers a moment ago. Um, in terms of the ridge of the proposed um, uh, development so the top floor the setback top floor that is set lower than the ridge of the the main church building I think there was a query about that and I think officers have also proposed a condition that secures the details to ensure that that's correct uh, which is which is acceptable um, there was also a lot of discussion about whether this is not 
is or is not enabling development. And I, I hope that officers have clarified that point clearly that it's not enabling development. I think the, the, the use of the phrase enabling development has been used quite loosely in some of the documents, but uh, it's not a, an enabling development as far as, as, far as uh, Heritage England policy is concerned. But this development will facilitate works to the listed building. And I think that covers all the points. So um, I think for, for the reasons I've set out, the reasons that are in the officer's very detailed committee report, um, we hope that the committee can um, agree with your officer's recommendation to approve. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So does the, yes, the committee do have questions. Councillor Ibrahim, please. So can we go back to the the point um, that we were made earlier and it'd be it'll be interesting to hear from you about the afford the lack of affordable housing because you haven't addressed that in your presentation at all. So could you elaborate on why um, you're able to provide a home that you will not receive any um, income from, but then not able to um, provide uh, at least one affordable home? Okay, thanks, Councillor. I, I didn't mention it specifically because I, I thought um, Mr. McNair had covered the point, but um, even if that um, man's accommodation was sold privately as part of the development, there still wouldn't be sufficient funds to provide any affordable. We, we would still be in deficit. I think this scheme is at about 9% GDV. The normal expectation is about 17 to 20% GDV. Um, so it's substantially lower than where a private developer would be. But the work that we do with community organisations, churches, uh, as mentioned earlier, that we work with a lot of Baptist churches, this is not our first scheme of this nature. Um, we've delivered two already, and we've got a couple of others at, at pre-app at the moment. Um, simply, it, it starts with the church. We're, we're working for the church. Um, the starting point is to create their, their community hall, and we need to generate funds that will deliver those works. So the 15 units that we are proposing is, is the amount of development that we need to deliver those works. So there isn't the, the sort of the, the, the benefit in kind is the community uh, use, uh, which doesn't leave any money then for the for the for the affordable units. Sorry, I want clarity on that further. Um, so you, you mentioned selling the home. I'm not talking about selling the home. Even if you you, you are providing one home free of charge, you've got no income coming from that. Correct. So if you let it at even the maximum that you can charge as an affordable unit at 80 percent, you would be making um, a, a return on that because at the moment you're proposing to not charge the person who will be living there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, even if it was private or affordable or whatever, it's still the scheme is still in deficit, so it, it technically cannot viably provide either a unit on site or, or a payment in lieu. It doesn't matter what tenure that's in, it, the scheme is always going to be in deficit. Can I just bring Rob Shitovsky in here, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Councillor Ibrahim, for raising the issue amongst other councillors. So I um, understand where the question's coming from, but must remind committee that um, the decision that committee has to make by law has to be made in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. And in this case, the scheme on the table is what the scheme is on the table. So we can't be assessing another scheme. I know I know where the question is coming from, but we have to assess the scheme as is with the pastor's house as part of that. Um, so the question is, is it in accordance with the development plan policy and the development plan policy is all the policies that have been discussed, including on affordable housing and affordable housing is 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 absolutely and it's it's in fact development plan policy. So absolutely correct. Um, but the question there is um, it is subject to viability. So the viability evidence has demonstrated that um, it, it is it is it is not viable um, even as a private unit. It's below um, the threshold. So um, so that's that's the question when making a determination on this planning application that needs to be answered. 
um, by committee is, is it needs it needs to show that it's in accordance with policy and the assessment that's been done shows that it is in accordance with policy because the viability evidence has backed that up so i just wanted to be clear that's what has to be in committee's mind i know where the question is coming from but that is the position that has to be in committee's mind when making the decision thank you thank you so councillor emery Uh, yeah, my question relates actually to the um, uh, to more of the um, the comments online and then the questions related to the um, the actual consultation. So I know there's quite a lot of large number of objections to the consultation, and also one of the um, people mentioned mentions the meeting back in September 2022. I just want to question what changes were made following that meeting, and also I did see mention of a suggested second meeting with the community. Why did that not take place? Um, I'm trying to think in terms of the changes that were made to the scheme. I think that uh, we obviously had comments about design principally, I think were, were, were the main objections to it in terms of the size, scope, scale, bulk. Um, concurrently, we were having discussions with the officers, um, you know, uh, the design officers, conservation officers, and also went through the Harringay Council's quality review panel. And it was felt through all of those discussions that you know we were we were actually giving being given quite favorable comments from uh officers and also from the quality review panel in terms of design um uh, they welcomed us to um submit the application so we felt that you know we had we had reached a position where whilst yes there were objections to um to the design principally from local residents that we were being given a different opinion uh, and design is, is is one of those things it's very opinion based um, that we were encouraged to submit the application so we we did and that further consultation would be undertaken through the statutory uh, processes in any event so that the, the officers would uh, allow residents obviously further comments uh, and if I think if officers felt that those comments were material and just that we would be invited to make amendments uh, during the course of the application. But you know, the scheme before you is is largely as it was submitted. Yes, we've made a few tweaks along the way, but um, officers are content. Con conservation officers are content, uh, and as I say, the quality review panel was 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 very in favour of what what we had done. In fact, we we were being encouraged to be older um, by the quality review panel, um, but through discussions with officers, it actually felt a more muted response in terms of the brick principally. Um, I think we, we'd seen that metallic image previously, which was an earlier iteration. Um, wasn't the way to go in the conservation area in the building setting. So um, yeah, that's, that's where we were on that. And I think just just in, in just one on one thing in terms of the community use, I think there's perhaps miscommunication in terms of what we had su suggested at, at the initial pre-up. Um, we, we have always said that you know this this firstly does um, meet the needs of the church. They have specific requirements in terms of Sunday service and Sunday school, things like that. But there would always be opportunities for further community use. And there, there was a condition, I think, proposed by officers to ensure that that does happen. But it was always envisaged that we would, you know, during the construction of this, uh, getting closer to the time when this facility would actually open, that there would be further discussions in terms of what exactly other, other people want to use it for uh, that would then dictate the fit out. You know, we, we see this as a very, very flexible space. It's in the basement. It's designed to be very robust, so it can take a whole range of different uses um with you know movable furniture and all these things so it can cater for a, a lot of different uh, needs um so just wanted to make sure that that was clear that there was always the intention for the space to be used not only by the church but by the local community uh thank you for that councillor brennan um i actually don't doubt that you did intend a communal use for that but i think it was a big 
um, miscommunication, possibly, because it wasn't understa understandable at all from the papers. Um, I, I don't quite know how to say that, to ask this, but it, it appears that, it, that there was a, an opinion held in the community that was obvious to yourselves, developers, and it possibly was it not considered simply not considered important because it wasn't you didn't need to listen to it because it wasn't shared by the officers that you were dealing with. Was that basically the situation? Because if you're working with the community, intending to have a community asset, you would help hope to bring the community with you, and if your attitude, you know. If there was a community feeling about the actual building being wrong for the area or something like that, I just feel that 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 wasn't picked up, and and I I ask why wasn't it picked up? Maybe in future it will be picked up. Do you feel that it might have been a mistake not to pick it up? Well, I don't, as I say, I don't, I don't think it was ignored as such. We 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 were having concurrent conversations with the with the local community and with the. QRP and with officers. So all of those comments had informed ultimately what we submitted. So the, the scheme that you saw on the back page of the addendum was the, the scheme that we presented at the community consultation. We were told it was ugly, it was too modern, too bulky. Um, and you know we had we had other comments from officers um, um, and all of those comments had informed Ultimate where we got to. So you can see actually how different that scheme is compared to the scheme that's actually now formally in front of you. There were quite considerable changes made. Um, so I don't think it's fair to say that we ignored them. Um, it was it was a whole round of, you know, there, there are lots of contrasting and conflicting things that we need to uh, consider when we, we pull together schemes like this. It's not easy. Um, uh, you know, we've got conservation harm. We've got, you know, officers wanting to push us to be um, providing you know, buildings of their time. We've also got the um, GLA housing standards that need to be met. All of these conflicting matters that need to be put into a building. We can't do a, a sort of Victorian terrace. It's impossible because of the requirements of balconies and all these other modern things. So we think we've got a great balance in terms of what we're delivering. It's a it's a it's a scheme that uh, we think reflects the context, and we'll we'll make a contribution. When it's built. Uh, thank you for that. I just want to bring in uh, Matthew Barrett, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I just need to remind members that whilst there is a debate going on and whilst people are speaking and adding to that debate, members should be in the room hearing everything. It could compromise what this committee is doing if members are going in and out during the debate. Thank you. Right, OK, well, can you just all note that, please? Um, so I've got Councillor Bevan. Yeah, so I think the objectors said that there hadn't been much cons consultation about community use, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I note there's a paragraph in here, 6.2.19, about future community use. I wonder if we could strengthen the wording to make sure that that is really effective and happens uh, as soon as practical. I put that to officers and I'm sure you would not have an objection to that. And then the other point that was raised was about these houses won't be bought by Haringey residents. Would you be accepting of a recommendation that for the first six months these houses would only be or these flats would only be offered for sale to Haringey residents because we do have that requirement on some schemes I'm not so I'm asking you whether you would be accepting of, of that as, as a condition and then also we have a housing target in Haringey of 1,592 properties a year which we're obliged to deliver in accordance with the GLA requirements that encompasses all types of housing. So I'm correct in saying that this provision would help us meet the Mayor of London's 
target for Haringey, yes? I just want to bring uh, Robin McNocker in at that moment. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think um, with the applicant's agreement, um, we could enhance um, the additional condition that's included in the addendum, condition 39, um, based on um, some of the points we've heard this evening, um, to include an element of um, prior engagement um, with the local community um, to understand their needs. Um, I think that would be um, reasonable in line with policy. Um, on the point of um, marketing and, and priority to Haringey residents, um, we have no planning policy basis for that. So um, I think that would be best as an informative um, that the applicant um, should do that. Um, we would have that on um, shared ownership housing as part of our um, housing um, policies outside of the local plan. Um, and, and those are usually built into um, legal agreements for, for shared ownership and, and um, other types of intermediate tenure, but we don't have a policy requirement for that for private um, housing. So I think it would be um, unreasonable to include that without a policy basis, but I'm happy to include um, some form of wording in, a, in a, um, an amendment to condition 39 to reflect um, the need for engagement with the local community to meet their needs. The informative about having gay residents. Yes, sir. And yes, I'm informative, yeah. OK, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, just on the condition 39, no issue with that. You know, fully, fully accept uh, the suggestion that we carry out further consultation that would then inform the uh, means use plan. Um, I think that's that's it. I think I agree with the other the other comments that Mr. McNamara has just mentioned in terms of sales. Okay, thank you. So I've got Councillor Jamieson, Councillor Dunstall, and Councillor O'Donovan. So, Councillor Jamieson, please. Um, so you said the church hall would be used for things like Sunday schools and things like that. And in the papers, it says that the church hall doors open inwards, which is unacceptable. Um, and also, was it on one of the floors? I mean, uh, inward opening escape doors serving the church area within the new lower ground floor are unacceptable. And also the inner rooms issue to the flats on the third floor have not been addressed. So can you ask the question about the door? Sure. Uh, these were some comments that were raised by Building Control, um, I think, in the last two to three weeks. Um, so just, just as, as, the, as the scheme was being prepared for committee, um, we've submitted revised drawings which address that. So we've switched the swing of the doors, simply the swing of doors, whether they're open in or out. It's just a means of escape point. Uh, and then the inner rooms on the third floor, again, the kitchens have been compartmentalised. Um, so it doesn't affect the size or the use. It's just that the kitchens are now enclosed from a, from a fire regulations point of view. So that, that those both points have been addressed. Councillor Dunstone. Yeah, thank you. Um, just going back to uh, the consultation and uh, changes that were or, or, or weren't made, I wondered if you could just be a bit more sp specific about any um, substantive changes that were made, because it doesn't look like there's been much substantive changes. And one of the um, objectors had highlighted concerns around sizing and mass, which you also made a, a nod to but again that doesn't look like there's been substantive changes there so um just wondering if you could speak to that yeah i think when we consulted residents we were at 16 units um so we've lost a unit so 15 units is the scheme now so obviously that's that's um some loss in terms of the overall mass and bulk um we had also changed the stepping arrangement on the braemar avenue facade so um there is more of a chamfer on the final scheme that you see uh, again giving a a deference to the listed building um, and also quite significantly um, there was a change in materials so um, it's now a predominantly brick building so it's more traditional in terms of the, the brick palette um, and um, reflecting the Edwardian properties predominantly predominantly Edwardian properties along the street um, I think that we we'd also reduced um, after the consultation some of the stepping towards the rear of the property adjacent number one, Braemar Avenue, where you see that uh, relationship stepping away. That, that those steps were adjusted um, to preserve the sort of forty-five degree 
viewing angle that is common, commonplace in planning. And then during the application period, through discussions with the officer, we've we've again changed some of the windows and the use of the terrace, uh, the areas there. So again, ensuring that um, potential for overlooking is is mitigated. OK, thank you. Um, and so, Councillor Donovan, please. OK, thank you. Um, thank you for coming and particularly thank you to the objectors um, for coming. I'm coming back to condition 30, 39 and I certainly welcome the suggestion earlier that there should be um, formal community community involvement in the decision made. And as you know, the, um, the development will not commence until a community use plan has been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. And as I said, I welcome the involvement of the local community there. Um, and I hope that during those discussions, the church will also have heard um, what the what some of the objectors said today, in particular, the local councillor said today in relation to that there's probably no shortage of commercial spaces that can be rented. But what there is shortage of is free spaces for the, um, the, the need of the local people. And I would hope that consideration in this process would be given by the church to allowing local people to hire the space for free or at a very small amount of money. So it truly does become Obviously, it will be used by the church for their uses on Sundays, etc. But also, it will really become a, a real social asset to the area, which is desperately needed. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I'm sure that that is their intention, and certainly the schemes that we've delivered. So we've delivered one in Homerton already that's that's active, and another one in West Ham, which was opened about nine months ago. Um, both of those schemes have community use plans. Both of those schemes have uh, spaces that can be hired for not very much money at all, uh, or even free, depending on what the use is uh, and the time of the day. So, yeah, again, I fully expect that to be the same case here. Okay, so I think there's no more questions. So thank you um, very much. So can I now, um, uh, I'd like to ask Robbie McNocker to confirm the proposal with a summary of any changes, please. Thank you, Chair. And I think just one final point on the um, thorny issue of, of viability is, is worth noting that there are um, early and late stage reviews in the recommendation, which we haven't um, mentioned earlier. So um, if there is an uplift in value through the development being delayed um, and um, values increasing or um, during the build, um, build costs reduce and um, values increased, uh, those are included in the recommendation, just worth emphasising. Um, one point um, that also needs a mention is that um, one of the um, objectors um, rightfully mentioned the issue of BATS and um, the applicant has submitted um, a BATS survey, um, but just given the time that it's has taken um, for this application's been assessed, um, that will need um, redone again. So um, that's an additional um, recommendation is to include a condition um, for a further um, BAT emergence survey, which um, has been done um, just over a year ago um, and, and will need redone. So um, just then to, to summarise, so the, the um, recommendation is um, to approve subject to conditions and, and section 106 as amended in the addendum and um, to include that additional um, condition, which will be 49, uh, 40, 40 on the, um, the BAT survey, an amendment to condition 39, um, to include engagement um, on the needs of, of local residents and through the community use plan and then an informative um, re requesting that the applicant um, give priority to local residents in their sales and that's the um, the recommendation. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ibrahim. It's at this point that we um, I would like to move a motion to reject on the basis of lack of affordability. Case. So we need reasons and well, and all the, the, the reason is lack of affordable housing. Is there a seconder? So. Councillor Brennan. So I want to bring uh, Robbie McNocker in now, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Just advise on um, 
the sort of merits of, of that. So um, there is an, an independent um, viability assessment that has looked at this issue and, and found um, that um, no further affordable housing would be viable. Um, to the uphold this reason, you would then need to be able to employ um, a, a, a viability consultant um, at a potential appeal um, to provide evidence that did find um, that there was a surplus. Um, officers um, you know, believe that we, we've used the, the absolute um, best in the business at, at um, interrogating these um, and you know, our recommendation is based on the fact that we're satisfied that um, no affordable housing is viable. Right, so I just want some advice from the Right, that's right, Academy. You've got a proposal, you've got a second. Uh, that is on the table. That has to go first. Okay, all right. So, so we now, so we vote on that proposal. Right. Well, you are you are voting on a refusal on the grounds of a lack of affordable housing, contrary to your your policies. All right, I'm not happy with that. Probably, yes. Yeah. Okay, so all. If you wish to refuse, you vote for that motion. Sorry, I'm confused about that. So. <laughs> the, the, the motion just... is to refuse. If you want to refuse, you vote for that motion. So, all those in favour of refusing, please show. I, I think I thought I just got that right, but go on then, Councillor Dunstall, please. So I just want to make sure that I'm absolutely clear on this. So what, what you're saying, Robbie, is that if we vote to refuse, as per the motion, that will that is being done on the basis that we are challenging the viability report. But they're nodding, Reg. That, that's correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. So. Um, you would, you would, in essence, be having to say that you believe that the viability evidence is not correct um, because the policy says it has to be subject to viability. So the only ground to, to challenge that finding would be to say that the viability evidence isn't correct. You, you can't challenge the policy. That it's, it's absolutely clear. Point of order. We can't have a debate. The uh, hang on, please. On the of, Councillor uh, Rice, just wait a moment. I'm just trying to work we, my we way through all of this. Can we, we just bring a... the legal officer in first of all, please? Thank you. Yes, I, I'm, I'm trying to challenge. Uh, yeah, I mean, the points have been made by the objectors about um their concerns about the um viability reports um all members have heard that it really is up to members as to whether uh, how, how much credibility and weight they give to that as compared to uh the job which has been done by your own planning officers um so what we now have uh yeah i'm, I'm sorry this is not something the debate is over. This is now around the table. Um, the motion on the table is to refuse this on the grounds of the lack of affordable housing. That is the motion on the table. If you want to refuse, you vote for that motion. It may well be that after, if you do refuse, that we may need to go back and review those figures. But that is the motion, and that is what you're voting for. So I don't think there's anything else that should be added, uh, Madam Chairman. We've got a motion, um, and I, I think it really ought to be the question you should, you should be asked for the question to be put. OK, so we are so we're going to vote then um, on this motion, which is to re refuse the application on the grounds of affordable housing. So those in favour of the motion, please show. And those against?
OK, so. Motion is passed as strong. Um, yeah, it's five votes for the motion, four votes against. OK, so that's that's the end of this. Um, that's the end of this item. Yes. Now then. OK, um, right, so then we are now moving on to, so we move on to the next, so we move on then to the next item. Yes, OK, all right, so we're now on to item nine, and that's update on major proposals, which is in the agenda uh, as, as pages 177 to 192. So, Anna, so um, to advise on major proposals in the pipeline, including those awaiting the issue of the decision notice following a committee resolution and subsequent signature of the Section 106 agreement. Applications submitted and awaiting determination and proposals being discussed at the pre-application stage. So are there any questions on this? No, okay. So we're now on to item 10, which is applications determined under delegated powers, pages 193 to 282. Um, are there any questions on, on, on these items, please? No, okay. So we're on to item 11. There are no new items of urgent business. And the date of the next meeting, please note this, it is the 28th of November, 2023. So thank you very much. Thank you. Put the microphone on, please. Yeah, the notice that came out with the supplementary papers in terms of the next meeting, it says 20th February, 2023. Strategic committee, that's different. It doesn't say strategic. That's next week. It says to note the date of future meetings, 20th of February 2023. Well, just note them, please. That, so next week is the strategic committee, which is different from this one. And the next uh, uh, planning subcommittee is um, on the 28th of November. Thank you. Uh, sorry, go on, Cody. Just wanted to quickly say if you wanted papers for those meetings, I've left them at your table the strategic planning this i've left papers for you okay thank you very much right. um for this evening and good evening to you all and thank you thank you, thank you.